Dios. To all the graduates, proud of our graduates graduating, commencement, it's not the end of anything. As you know, it's the beginning. Open your Bibles to the book of John, John chapter 19. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John chapter 19. I'll be there in a minute. John chapter 19. Thank you, Parker, for praying for the service. The last, the last few weeks, guys, we've been talking about the, the, the sayings from Christ from the, the cross, his last words, which were so important to grasp. His, all of his words are important, as you know, the word of God, but to, to grasp his last words. And, and when you think about this scene that took place, amen, as the, as the crowd came from the city, the two criminals, the man Christ Jesus, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. It's crucifixion time. They got hammers and nails. There's screams of pain. There's gas. There's men stripped naked. Bugs and flies are everywhere. The heat is beaten down. Sweat's rolling off the bodies. Blood everywhere. The stench and smell of death and talking and laughing. And here he is, the king of the Jews. Now it's 12 o'clock. Three statements have been made between 9 and 12. First, of course, was the, the, uh, what I'd call the reconciliation. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. We preached on the conversion part. I tell you the truth. Today you'll be with me in paradise, speaking to the thief next to him. The commission to his mother. Of course, we celebrated Mother's Day a couple of weeks ago when he said unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. From that hour, that disciple took her into his home. Last week, we dealt with the cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Suddenly, the light shines. It's after 12. There on the center cross, Christ clearly about to die. Every breath now is huge effort. Heaving, gasping, fighting for oxygen, resting upon the nail holes while he inhales sweat pouring off of him, making some strange guttural noises. The experienced soldiers had heard it before. It's known as the death rattle. With one last gasp, a sound comes out of him. You can barely hear it three feet away. You're just barely able to say it. And here at the bottom of the cup, the Scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made him sin to be sin for us. When I said that God turned his back on him, I'm not saying that he, he forsook his son. He actually turned his back on the sin that was being poured upon him. And Jesus saying, why did you forsake me? But all the sins of the world, the cesspool, we called it last week, been poured upon him all of our sins passover taught us that we are to eat a lot of lamb and a little bit of bitter herb jesus tasted the gall even in the worst of pain we're going to talk about that and, and here's the thing you can taste it but don't digest it in life you can taste bitterness in life you can taste pain in life you can taste hurt but you don't have to digest it you don't have to take it in what i mean by that is simply this you are what you think you are and if you think you're sick all the time, you're going to be sick. You think you're hurt. If you think the world's against you, it's going to be against you. You can taste the pain and the hurt, but you don't have to digest it. You don't have to bring it inside you and let it manifest and, and change who you are. Amen. So Jesus on the cross, he makes this sound, and it's somewhere around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, right near the end, John 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, he did everything that he came to do. As a good son, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, and it's almost like you realize, okay, there are passages in the word of God that I need to share at this moment. You know, this is what makes God, God, to fulfill things. And by the way, I can't explain God. A God that can be explained is probably no God at all. Can I get an amen? I can't explain who he is. He, he's just amazing, the things he does. But Jesus reaches back in his memory, and he realizes that he needs to say something to fulfill it. And he said, I thirst. It don't say he screamed it. I thirst. I thirst. Now, there was a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the, sp uh, the sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop, upon a sponge, and put it near his mouth. And, of course, we'll talk about the, the vinegar was actually known as gall. It was a bitter drink, if you would. It's a terrible pain. It's not often appreciated, everything that Jesus did when he died for us. Uh, we, we walk through it. We get through. We hit Easter, and we move on. I'm glad we're taking a little more time with this. If you run the clock back from 3 to the moment of his death, Back to about 3 o'clock in the morning, you just see what happened to Christ as he moves through those hours that you discover is that our Lord Jesus, amen, has been through 12 hours of torture. 
arrested in the middle of the night, slapped around, pushed around, mocked, slapped again, crowned with thorns, went into his scalp, scourged with a cat of nine tails again and again, those sharp pieces of leather studded with bits of bone, stone, and metal, amen, until you could see right through the rib cage. They took his beard, ripped it out, they beat him, beat him again. They made him carry the cross, they nailed the nails into his hands and his feet, not for one second did he have a moment's rest, not for one moment that body, that anybody offered him anything. It is not too much to say that Jesus hung on the cross. He was not beautiful. He was not manicured. He was not the savior of the artist's renditions. It is not too much to say that when Jesus hung on the cross, he was bloodied, he was maimed, he was disfigured. His version of a human being, you know, and oftentimes we think to ourselves, well, can God heal this? Can God change that? Imagine if you would. They broke, uh, they, they, they punctured his side. They broke the other guy's legs. They punctured his side. If he was to come off the cross, his body just naturally could not get well again. He had lost too much blood. But God has this thing called resurrected power. Amen. It even talks about in our own lives that he'll resurrect us, that there, there's a quickening, the Scripture says, in our own bodies. And I look for it at times. Some of you, you know what I'm talking about when, you, when everything's creaking and hurting and all of a sudden you get a little, uh, 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 a little gusto, a little Octane, a little, a little, it's like a little turbo in the backside. Amen. And you're able to get moving again. That resurrected power that God gives you, you call it Holy Ghost, anointing, anything you want to call it. But every now and then on this earth, God injects it into our lives. Can I get amen? Amen. He helps us do what we never thought we could do again. Didn't think we could pull this off. And hear this body, when it comes out of the grave, resurrected, changed, and healed. You know, and, and when I think about all the things, the blood leaving him, the sweat leaving him, no wonder he was thirsty. Some of you can't even make it through this preaching. Just knowing that fountain's back there in the back. Of cool, clean, Water. And you say, I'm a little thirsty. You know, oftentimes you'll watch me, and you've many of you watched me for years. I very seldom will drink a drink of water from the pulpit because I don't want to tempt you to get up and walk out of here. Because you think to yourself, well, he drank, I can drink. But I'm the one up here talking and sweating already. He was thirsty. He lost blood. He exposure, heat, exhaustion, dehydration. He's been on the cross for six hours. The sweat rolls off him like buckets. It's hot, and the flies are buzzing around, and the crowds are taunting him. The blood mixes with the sweat as it pours off his body. In this uh, end of dehydration, as it begins to set in, first it gives you a fever. Then it gives you a terrible throbbing pain in your head. And then cramps in your abdomen that are pulling on your legs that are stuck into the spikes and yanking on your arms that are stuck in the spikes. And then nausea sets in. And then your eyeballs begin to dry up in the sockets. And then your lips begin to dry. You, you slur your speech as your tongue swells. And then your throat feels like sandpaper. Your vocal cords are barely able to do anything. And from that, he says, I thirst. I need a little something. The, and this is what hits me. Jesus said this, that if you drink from me, you'll never thirst again. And this is the balance of the word of God to me. I understood exactly what he meant by that. But then he, the water of life is now dying of thirst. I suppose it's one of the ultimate ironies of the biblical story that when he cries, I thirst, he who is the water of life is now dying of thirst. I want to make you show a little attention here. Jesus had not complained all about his physical condition through all the hours of suffering. Then they put the crown on his head. He didn't say, oh, my head. When they ripped his beard, he didn't say, oh, my face. When they scourged him, he didn't say, oh, my back. As the old spiritual song said, he never said a mumbling word. It's one word in Greek, dipso, I thirst. So, amen. The soldiers got a, a, a bowl. And by the way, speaking of that, you know how quick we complain about everything? I didn't get fries with that. They put mustard on my hamburger. You know how often we complain about every little thing? And yet, six hours, he's not complained yet. 
And then he says, dip so. I, I thirst. The soldiers got a bowl uh, in a pail that they'd always carried with them. It had in it sour vinegar. It was a kind of vinegar wine mixed with water. It was one of the cheapest drinks of the day. I think we called it Boone's Farm back when I was young. It was the drink of the common man. It was the drink of the Roman soldier. Fulfilling prophecy out of Psalm 69, 21. Reproach has broken my heart. I am full of heaviness, and I look for some to take pity. But there was none for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Gall is something bitter to endure. We have in our body this thing called the gall bladder. It supposedly takes out impurities and, and the bitterness that you keep sucking in through your esophagus. It runs down through there, and every now and then it gets infected, and they, it gets messed up, and they got to yank that thing out of your body, and then I don't know where the vinegar, excuse me, the gall goes. But everybody say something bitter to endure. Say it again, something bitter to endure. That's life. Everybody say life. It's up to me how I'm going to deal with it, what I'm going to do with it. But here was the opportunity for him to be offended. Here was the opportunity for him to be bitter. The word offense carries the word scandal. Scandalon would be the, the, the Greek word, the part of the trap to which the bait was attached, hence laying a trap for someone's way. Many, I find, it seems like in life, all they want to do is lay traps for people and, and see if they'll take the bait. And they say things in such a way that you're between a rock and a hard place. You can't even get out of it properly you know I've been put there before in life and and I realized that this opportunity to be offended this opportunity to take it in to ingest it instead of just taste it amen was one other thing Jesus said in Luke 17 and when I, I first time I read this I thought ah because when you get born again you get in the church world and you get being around people that you thought knew Jesus you think they would no longer be offended about every little thing and it seemed like as Americans, we have a right to be. Then said he to his disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It would be better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck and he cast into the sea that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If, in, if your brother trespasses against you, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Oh, oh. By the way, and if he trespasses against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day, turn again and says, I repent, you should forgive him. And the apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith. Give us more faith. Help me understand. Faith says, you know, I got to see this. I, by faith, I need to see something manifest. In other words, if I keep offended, keep getting offended, help me see that we're going to have a relationship, that this thing's going to be a better thing off in life. So increase my faith. That's a good statement. Amen. I need more faith. We all need more faith. But our response to an offense determines our destiny. When you get offended, how are you going to handle it? Jesus, all through the cross experience, you don't see offense coming out in him. It imprisons countless believers. It severs relationships. It widens the existing breaches between us. Offense. I am offended. Offended people are divided into two categories. Those who have been treated unjustly and those who believe they've been treated unjustly. Amen. A lot of times they haven't been. They just think they have. They judge by assumption, by appearance, by hearsay. And it's the dealing with your heart's condition. Offenses hide behind pride. Pride will keep you from admitting your true condition. I ain't hurt. That didn't hurt me. That didn't bother me. Sometimes best to come out and say, yeah, it did. That, that did affect me. Pride keeps you from dealing with the truth. It distorts your vision. You don't change when things are fine, pride causes you to view yourself as a victim. My behavior is justified. I was mistreated. I know that we say, and I, I, I'm sure I've said it, that this generation seems to have a little bit of an entitlement attitude. It seems to get offended easy if folk don't go that way. But the truth of the matter is human nature has always been that way. We've always had to fight this. We've always had to fight the idea of thinking we are the victim. When I think of David in David's life, what a, what a story, isn't it? Amen. He, he goes from one, taking care of the sheep. He goes in uh, before Saul. 
He deals with Goliath. He takes Goliath to the ground. He, he kills uh, the Philistine warrior. He becomes Saul's main guy. He goes out. He, he, he takes care of 200 Philistines. I won't go into that whole story, but that whole issue was so that he could marry Saul's daughter. Then Saul gets jealous. David takes off running. Saul tries to pin him down with, and here's a man, he just wants to be his father. This father figure thing, when Jesus said it would be better for you to have a millstone tied around your head than to offend one of these little ones, I want you to realize this as adults. These kids look at us as mothers and fathers. They look at us as guardians. They hug us and embrace us. And to, to not offend them is a powerful thing. In other words, to, to, to not allow them to take offense with our actions and our words and the things that we do. David just wanted a daddy. He just wanted a daddy. I'm in Alabama. You know what I'm talking to my mom about? My dad's been dead a couple of years. I want to know more about my daddy. In other words, there were things that I never asked my dad because, well, it's just the way it was. And my mother, my mother actually told me my dad went all the way through school with a different lad. He took on his stepdad's name. He was James Wilbanks all the way through school. When he joined the military, they made him take whatever his name was on his birth certificate. Then he became James Hovatter. Didn't know that until this trip. It's like every time I go, I pick out a little bit more, get a little bit. I don't know how far I want to go on this tree. Amen. But, you know, that was far enough to help me understand a little bit. And I'll give you another quick little synopsis here. My, my, then my grandmother, who's my dad's mom, mom, she goes to Mississippi to take care of her, her sister. Boonville, Mississippi, take care of her sister. And, and I know this, this is... Uh, my life, and you probably don't care, but, but let me just tell you anyway. She, she goes to Mississippi and, and, and takes care of her. She dies. The sister dies. Um, grandma comes back home, and, and, and then the brother-in-law pursues my grandma. Y'all follow me now? My mom was telling me stuff I really probably didn't want to hear. Then, and then they get married. That explains why when I was a kid, we'd go to Mississippi and see grandma and Uncle Will. <laughs> Y'all ain't got family like I got family. Huh? Now I know why he was Uncle Will, why he wasn't Grandpa, why I called him Uncle Will. And he had a dog named Uno. Now you know where the card game come from because that was way back in the day. Because we always said, do you know Uno? Uno, never, never mind, leave it alone. As a little boy, I come up wondering about my dad all the time, and I'm going to tell you, every... Son, every daughter wants a daddy. David wanted a daddy. And the Jesse was his biological father. He didn't treat him much like a son. But he saw Saul as a dad. He saw the leader of Israel as a dad. And he wanted him as a dad. As a matter of fact, he spoke to him as a son would speak to a father. He meant more like that. So the time came when Saul tried to kill him. And they and tried to pin him to the wall. And David ran from him. And on one of those scenes where he's running, the scripture tells us, David then asked Ahimelech the Hittite and Abishag, the son of Zerul, Joab's brothers, who will go down into the camp with me to Saul? I'll go with you, said Abishag. So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there was Saul. So here's David sneaking into the camp. But there was Saul, the king, lying asleep. And what's Saul doing? He's chasing him. He's trying to kill him. Lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck to the ground near his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. That's, the, that's his defense. Abishag said to David, today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. David, look what God has done. He put everybody asleep so we could sneak in here and kill the man who's been trying to kill you. We're going to take him out. Now, let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of my spear. I won't strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him. Either his time will come until he will die or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and the water jugs that are near his head. Let's go. In other words, get some evidence that we had a chance to do it. We could have hurt you, 
but we didn't. This is one of the great uh, ironies, I think, of Scripture, and that you need to understand, I need to understand, it's a principle here. You have the opportunity to do harm to somebody who's been trying to harm you, but instead you didn't do it. You covered them, you looked at it, but you could have done it, but you didn't do it. Abishag's reason to kill Saul was numerous. First, Saul had murdered priests. Second, Saul had tried to kill David. Amen. Uh, third, David was anointed king. Amen. So he, you really ain't a king. After all God God put the army to sleep for us. As surely as the Lord lives, the Lord himself is going to allow us to strike him. There were three steps. Let me help you. Some of you are not real good at getting revenge, and I'm going to help you out. You're not good at it. I, I posted on, 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 on Facebook a fish that came out of a hole with sand in his mouth, and he spit sand into another fish's hole. And that fish gathered up sand, and he went back, and he spit fish into that, uh, uh, sand into that guy. And, and I'm watching this, and I'm almost paralyzed watching it because it's so funny. They're, they're spitting on each other back and forth. And I'm thinking how exhausting it is to keep trying to take revenge, how exhausting it is to keep trying to do things to other people because they've done it unto you. And, it, and I'm watching this, and I was telling Pastor Mike about it this morning, and I said to myself, wouldn't it have been funny if both of them would have come out of a hole and one great big fish come down and just swallow both of them? I ain't saying it could have happened. I don't know if it did or not. But first, you got to remember, in order to take revenge, you need to be injured. You need to have no control over the injury. David was hurt by Saul. Amen. He did not treat him as a son. Second, you need to be vulnerable. Your enemy or whoever will someday be in position for you to hurt them back. Dave had a chance in the cave and in the camp. Let me say that again. Your enemy or whoever has been hurting you someday they're going to be, you're going to be in a position to hurt them back. They're going to do something. You're going to be able to get them back. Third, you got to be depraved. Amen. Depravity. Go ahead. Use your sword or their spear. Refuse. Here's what we got to do. Refuse to yield. Refuse to take revenge. You must choose to do the right when wrong. Second, you'll never regret forgiving someone who doesn't deserve it. I'll forgive you when you do. No, no. They may never deserve it. Amen. But I forgive you. Jesus was destined for this. He took the trial with the hurt, but refused to get bitter. Jesus tasted the gall, the vinegar, and even the worst of pain. He taught us to taste it. Don't digest it. In other words, again, guys, gall is something bitter to endure. It's something we've got to endure. We will all be tested. Everybody here, behold, the scripture says, Isaiah 48, I have refined you, but not with silver. I've chosen you in the furnace of affliction. God refines us with afflictions that we may call offenses, trials, and tribulations. The heat of which separates impurity, such as unforgiveness. What I'm going through, what's that doing to me? It's taking away this unforgiveness you've got, your strife. Well, Pastor, you don't understand who I'm mad at has been dead for years. Let them go. Let them go. Let it go. Amen. Strife, bitterness, anger, envy, and so forth from the character of God in our lives. Our true condition don't let an offense keep you from fellowship. In this, as, as the longer I pastor, I get these groups. And thank God we got two churches and the internet. In other words, we got three churches now. We got the bunch that don't show up. But they're everywhere. They're all over the world. That bunch. And they, they contact us. We got this bunch and the other bunch. Amen. And when you got that, you got opportunity for offenses. And offenses do come. They do happen. Revelation 3.19 Watch this, out of the Message Bible. I love what he says here. He says, the people I love, you, you, I love you, I love you. Amen. I call to account. You, you know, the, today, yeah, not today, the other day I thought about your old boss, uh, Mark, because uh, I went to office and prayed with him before he passed. My mind goes back to people that I've connected with over the years, and I think about them, and I think about have we made enough impact into their lives did we connect enough with them and i read where it says the people i love i call to account prod and correct and guide so that they'll they'll live at their best up on your feet then about face run after god everybody say run after god <laughs> didn't we sing a song a while ago it says uh i'm running so, huh uh, i'm running for you i'm running watch this there are times in the word of god that Jesus happens along and connects with people, and they get healed. But there's one scripture that I remember in the book of Mark chapter 5, where a woman comes to a crowd, and she's going after him. And all through scripture, it says, seek me, come after me, 
Seek and you'll find. Knock and it'll be open. Move toward me. And I, and we sit back so often and we wait on God. Oh, I go to the hospital to wait on God. I go here to wait on God. And that, that's one thing. You might get healed at that moment. But to, when Jesus, when that girl touched him, he said, woman, thou art whole. Whole. Wholeness came over her because she ran after him. Somebody say, Ron. Many times in church life, we don't press in. We don't run after him. We look around, and if the crowd's bigger, we might run a little bit more. But if it's smaller, we, we may not. But the bottom line is this. I got to learn how to run after him. I got to chase after him. Oh, when I see the prodigal son coming back to the father, the father's running to him, but the boy's running to the father, and they embracing me. All through Scripture, I read this. David talked about, I said, dear, pants for the water, so my soul pants for you. In other words, I'm running after you. I got to be near you you. Amen. I, I will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You're going to be with me. Amen. I've chased you. There's something about being a God chaser. Somebody just chases after him. I want my healing, and I ain't waiting on it. I'm chasing after him. Amen. I need finances, I'm going to chase after him. I need relationships that are good for me, I'm going to chase after him. If I go after him, then he says, oh, what's that scripture? The kingdom of God. Seek First, seek. You don't say, and I know that scripture says about wait. I understand there's waiting time. But then there's this understanding. You, you can wait if you want to. But I'm going hunting. I'm going seeking. I'm going to see. And in every situation, if you look hard enough, you'll find him. Amen. I thirst. Dip so. And it touched his lips. All it did was wet him enough so he could clear and say his final few words. Stand with me. I want you to do something for me. And I'm, I, I'm so, first off, let me thank you for not sharing your offenses with me. Let me say it again. Thank you for not sharing your offenses with me. Not telling me who you're offended at, why you're offended at them. What you're upset about with parental issues. Oh, if you've got kids and they're over the age of 18, you're going to have other opportunities to be offended. Amen. Uh, th so your, your offenses are going to come. There, there's no way you're going to get away from them. But what can I do? You, you know, I've often said you, you, don't, you don't nurse it. You don't nurse the offense. You don't curse the offense. Stop rehearsing the offense. Reverse the offense. Jesus says, bless those who hurt you. Do something good for your enemy. Turn it around. Amen. And disperse it. Let it go. So don't curse it. Don't rehearse it. Don't nurse it. But reverse it. And disperse it. Get rid of it. You know what that's called? Freedom. You know what today and this weekend's about? Freedom. Amen. Those who died for us, freedom. Jesus died for you. He took your offense. He took your hurt. Oh, I know. If you let it go, you won't have much to talk about for a few days. But you can get in an encyclopedia. You can Google some stuff and learn some new stuff. Amen. And learn to talk about it. Amen. You don't have to always be hurt. You don't always have to allow people to own you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm not so concerned today if you're saved or not. I think I know this house. What I am concerned about is, are you going to let these offenses stop your growth in God? Are you going to let these offenses gall up and cause bitterness inside of you? Are you going to let these offenses cause you to sit back and not run toward God? Lord, help me shake this thing today. Don't let me leave this memorial weekend holding on to something, God, that I need to let go. I've been mad at you, preacher, for years, and I've never said it. I've been waiting on you around this church, amen, just to see how you're going to act. If it's me, get over me. Don't let me hold you back. Jesus, I love you. Release us. Release us. If I'm talking to anybody, hand up and down real fast. Real fast. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. Mm. Lord, I'm praying for healing to flow over this house. Those watching us online. Help us chase you. Run toward you. Remind ourselves there ain't nothing in this life 
worth staying offended over. Lord, you said they would come. You said if we're not careful, we would even offend the children around us. Help us be the mindful ones. Let our lives be so much after you that we release all the other things around us. God, I'm praying for, yeah, I know. Lord, their, their, their thoughts, if I let it go, I'll lose this, that, and the other. Lord, I'm praying that, that five times, ten times blessing comes into the lives of those who release. Financially, emotionally, physically, mentally, God, that you would pour back into their lives because they refuse to hold anger and grudges, Lord God, you would bless their life. And Lord, let it just be so seen that whoever they release is able to look at it and say, my goodness, I need to go to that person and ask for forgiveness from them. God, that's my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God some praise in here.